Hello and welcome to Begin Japanology. I'm Peter Barakan. Our topic for today's show is dashi, the savory cooking stock which is used in so many aspects of Japanese cuisine. In front of me here I have the ingredients that would make up a typical traditional Japanese breakfast. First of all, here is miso soup. Now miso is made from fermented soybeans and you'd think that the flavor derives solely from those. In fact, what underpins that flavor is dashi. And without the soup stock there, the miso soup just wouldn't taste like miso soup. We have a dish of boiled spinach with uh, sesame seeds on top and a brown sauce, which is made again of a mixture of soy sauce and dashi. And here in front of me is a simmered dish, and again this includes dashi. In fact, just about any Japanese cooking that's done with water, which includes simmered dishes, soups and anything like that, is going to have dashi somewhere in the equation. Now over here in this bowl we have just dashi by itself. As you can see it's a clear broth with a light golden color. But what's it made of and how is it made? That's what we're going to take a look at first. Japan is a land of abundant water. This island nation is bathed by the sea on all sides and close offshore warm ocean currents collide with cold currents. Since time immemorial the people of Japan have fished these fertile waters. Countless streams and rivers flow down from the mountains, blessing the land with an inexhaustible supply of fresh water. Water has had a crucial influence on the way people live and eat. The ocean, the lakes and the rivers offer fish and shellfish in abundance. To grow rice, the paddy fields are flooded. Numerous foods were developed, such as tofu and soba noodles that require plenty of pure fresh water. Water is needed to cook rice, to cook vegetables and fish, and to produce delicious sake and tea. Japan's distinctive cuisine developed thanks to the abundance of crystal clear water. And underlying that cuisine is the cooking stock known as dashi. Dashi is used extensively in Japanese cuisine from ordinary home cooking to the elaborate meals served in exclusive restaurants. It's made by infusing various kinds of dried seafood in water, either hot or cold, immersing them for many hours, then carefully heating them to draw out the components that produce this depth of flavor. Dashi can be prepared from a wide variety of different base ingredients. The most widely used ingredient is katsuobushi, fillets of skipjack tuna fish that are dried and processed until they form blocks as hard as stone. These katsuobushi blocks are shaved into fine flakes. The larger the surface area of these shavings, the more effectively the flavor components will be released. Another very common dashi ingredient is a species of kelp known as kombu. The wide sheets of kombu are cut into smaller strips which are left to soak in water to release their full flavor. Small dried fish known as niboshi are another ingredient widely used in dashi. Other dried fish are used such as mackerel, sardine or flying fish. Each region has its own tradition. All of these different ingredients can produce the underlying flavor component that gives Japanese cuisine its savor. That component is known as umami. What exactly is this umami taste that makes all the difference in dashi? Traditionally, there were thought to be four basic tastes. Sweet, sour, salty, and bitter. Then, 100 years ago, a fifth basic taste was identified as present in Japanese cuisine. It was called umami. Each dashi ingredient gives specific constituents of this taste identified as umami. The main constituent in the dashi derived from kombu kelp is glutamic acid. Glutamic acid is a type of amino acid, a building block for proteins. Kombu dashi has a clean, understated flavor. It's often used in clear broth soups or in simmered fish dishes. Dashi made from katsuobushi 
contains inosinic acid. This produces a flavor that is highly refined, yet very robust, with a distinctive aroma. This katsu adashi makes a great base for dishes such as simmered chicken with vegetables, or nikujaga, meat cooked with potatoes. When dashi is prepared using both katsuobushi and kombu, the combination results in an even richer umami flavor. The kelp is soaked and slowly heated. Then it's removed from the hot water and katsuobushi flakes are added. The glutamic acid from the kombu and the inosinic acid from the katsuobushi combine to form a dashi that has eight times the concentration of umami taste compared to dashi made from using kombu alone. Abundant water and bountiful oceans have blessed Japan with a tremendous variety of wholesome ingredients. Since ancient times, people have been experimenting with dashi to bring out the full flavor of these ingredients. I have a guest in the studio today, food specialist Yanagihara Naoyuki. Welcome to the program. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, I'm going to have to get you to get to explain to us in a little bit more detail yeah. what's it, what dashi is and how it influences the food that it's used in. Yeah. So, now I think it's try, you can try the first. Okay. The, this miso soup. Miso soup. Okay, we got two different versions, two different. right? It's without dashi and the with dashi. All right, I've already explained that without the dashi, it doesn't taste like it should do so. <laughs> yeah, you can try it With a little dashi. trepidation. Let's see. Mm, that's kind of salty and not really that tasty, actually. Mm -hmm. uh. There's nothing depth. Over. No, it doesn't have yeah. depth. Exactly, yeah. yes. You can try with All dashi. Right, let's, let's try the real one now. Mm, that's altogether different. In fact, even before it goes in your mouth, the smell is different, and yeah. the aroma. So, yes, there's a world of difference there. All right. Let's go on then, and y you can show us how to make the dashi. Okay, okay? so now I start to uh, explain about dashi. Mm -hmm. it's first, you can use the two ingredients with dashi. Uh, it's a kombu right. and a katsubushi. All right. It's first, put in the okay. cold water, Okay. It's co kombu. Okay, so this is going to take a little while to, to heat up. Yeah. Okay, that's starting to get a little color now, isn't it? And we, we can see some bubbles forming on the... Yeah, there's a small the bubbles, right? Yeah. So now you can take out the kombu already. This comes out at this stage? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can turn off the heat. Oh, all right. Yeah, then you can put the katsuobushi. And you put in quite a lot as well. I mean, you're, it's, yeah. it's a good portion there. You just put the flakes in and let them settle. Yeah. All right. That's one more point. Then they wait a minute. One minute. One minute. All right. Yeah. Okay. Now you can. Uh, you can strain, strain it. it. And there you have. Oh, that's lo lovely. Yeah. It's a nice so color, and get, it's very clear as yeah, well. Yeah, clear, right? Now, do I get to taste that as well? Oh, yes. Thank you. Mm. Mm. It's it's quite light, but it does have. Uh, yeah. Now, in the video we were taught about umami, mm -hmm. it's a little bit, uh, it's, I think the concept is a little difficult for people to understand if they're not familiar with it. Yes. I mean, everybody knows sweet, sour, bitter and salty, mm -hmm. but umami basically just means it tastes good, right? Mm -hmm. It means good taste. Yeah. So, how do you explain umami to people? I think it's very easy to explain is mm, the best way to describing uh, umami in uh, using music. As an example? Yeah, as okay. an example. It's that the basic taste, mm. sour, uh, sweet, salty, mm -hmm. is like a melody line. Okay. And uh, umami is like a bass, bass chord. So if you okay. co combination or combine with it, mm -hmm. it, you can get more tastier. So you need a balance of the both to, yes. to, to, get, to make really tasty food. So oh, okay. yeah, it's a good way to uh, improve that cooking. Uh -huh. Maybe you can get good dashi. It's the easiest way. Yeah. Okay, that sounds pretty good to me. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next, we're going to take a look at these two ingredients that go into dashi, the kombu and the katsuobushi, in a little more detail. 
Hokkaido is the northernmost of Japan's main islands. Kombu kelp growing wild in the ocean here is harvested in summer. Nearly all of Japan's own kombu comes from Hokkaido. Wild kombu can only be gathered between July and September. It's gathered from the shallow rocky reefs where it grows. A kelp harvester uses a glass to peer down to the seabed to spot the kombu. Then he uses a two-pronged pole called a makka to twist the kelp and hoist it out of the water. In two years, kombu can grow to as much as three meters long. The freshly harvested kombu can easily spoil, so it is immediately laid out on the shore to dry in the sun. Each side is dried for a day to draw out the moisture. Eventually, a white powdery substance starts to appear on the surface. This is mamite, one of the compounds responsible for giving the umami flavor. The process of drying the kombu concentrates these flavor components. From Hokkaido, much of the dried kombu is transported to Osaka, 1,200 kilometers away for sale. There are around 130 specialist kombu dealers in Osaka. Not all of the kombu is used to make dashi. Some is preserved for being processed into other kinds of foods, such as tsukudani. There is a long tradition of shipping kombu from Hokkaido to Osaka. This trade route developed about 400 years ago at the start of the Edo period. The vessels that carried the kombu, called kitamaibune, plied the route between northern Japan and Osaka in western Japan, which was the main market for Hokkaido kombu. In the 19th century, Osaka was the center of a massive trade in kombu, and numerous kombu processes became established in the city. It's not far from Osaka to Kyoto. Here, a vegetarian cuisine known as Shojin Ryori was developed based on Buddhist precepts. Kombu was prized because it added flavor to meals made without meat. Because of this tradition, rather than katsuo dashi, kombu dashi is more commonly used in the Kansai region around Osaka and Kyoto. Doi Junichi is the owner of a long-established kombu shop in Osaka. Set up in 1903, this store specializes in processing and selling kombu shipped from Hokkaido. Each piece of kombu has its own texture and flavor. Doi checks every piece, carefully sorting them according to their color, thickness, aroma and taste. If he's not sure, he cuts off a small corner and chews it. Kombu that has a good flavor but looks less attractive is kept for use in making dashi. Softer pieces are set aside to be eaten as a food. The role of a kombu dealer is to be an intermediary between the producer and the consumer. In the far southwest of Japan in Kagoshima Prefecture lies the city of Makurazaki. It's renowned as a center for producing katsuobushi. Every year in September, a katsuobushi auction is held here. Wholesalers gather from all over Japan for this auction, seeking the highest quality katsuobushi. Katsuo, or skipjack tuna, is known to have been eaten in Japan as far back as the 5th century. This fish is an important source of protein in the Japanese diet. Because the flesh of this fish is very soft, and spoils easily, it wasn't easy to transport to inland areas. So over the centuries, techniques were developed for preserving the katsuo by drying it. Blocks of katsuo bushi similar to those used today first began to be made during the 17th century. The technique was conceived for drying the fish by smoking them over a fire 
to give them greater flavor and aroma. Imaki Ire Shusaku has been preparing katsuobushi in Makurazaki for 30 years. This is premium katsuobushi known as Hongare Bushi. It takes six months to produce each block, a process which concentrates the umami flavor. The first step in preparing katsuobushi is to select the fish. If they are too fatty, the katsuobushi will not produce a translucent soup. If the fat content is too low, there will be no depth to the flavor. The fish that are selected must have just the right level of fat. First the fish are cut lengthways into fillets and then cut again into half. This forms the shape of the finished katsuobushi block. The fillets are then laid out in rows and immersed in hot water to consolidate the umami flavor. Then they are coated in katsuo paste covering every indentation in the surface. This will prevent them from cracking during the drying process. Next the fish are dried in a wood-fired smokehouse. This reduces the moisture content by about 60%. For ordinary katsuobushi, this is the end of the processing. But for the premium fillets, further work is needed. This chamber holds katsuobushi fillets that have been treated with a special mold. This mold produces fragrant compounds in the fish. It also reduces the triglycerides that can cause cloudiness in the soup. These katsuobushi will produce dashi broth that is more translucent. The katsuobushi fillets are then dried in the sun to prevent too much mold growth. This process is repeated many times, taking about six months to complete. The result is premium katsuobushi known as Hongare Bushi. In this premium katsuobushi, the moisture content is reduced by 80%. Inside, they have a glossy translucence. This ruby hue is an indication that it will produce dashi of the highest quality. Of course, it's a very complicated process with numerous steps. If you cut corners along the way, neglect a step in the process, the difference is bound to show in the final product. It will be obvious in the flavor. It's easy to tell. Kombu from the far north and Katsuobushi from the southwest. The secret of the deep savor in Japanese cooking comes from dashi made from these two ingredients. Since ancient times, fish has been a primary source of protein for the people of Japan. And especially for people living inland without access to the ocean, sea fish was a very valuable commodity. So hundreds of years ago, various processes were developed so that fish could be preserved, so it could be transported inland. These processes included things like boiling, pickling in vinegar, but in particular, as we saw in the video just now, both for fish and for seaweed, drying techniques became very sophisticated. The original reason for the drying was just for preservation, but subsequently people came to realize that when you cooked the dried seafood, in water or as a broth, it started to release flavors that tasted really good. And as I mentioned earlier on, the word umami means tastes good. And that's how dried seafood became the basis for dashi. Now dashi is extremely important in Japanese cuisine. And if you go to a good Japanese restaurant, the preparation of the dashi is of paramount importance. There are probably as many ways of preparing dashi as there are Japanese chefs. On our next video, we're going to take a look at one specific great dashi recipe. In Kyoto, Japan's ancient capital, a highly refined culinary culture has flourished since ancient times. This Kyoto restaurant has been in business for 400 years. 
Takahashi Eiichi is the 14th generation owner of the restaurant. He prepares the classic Kyoto cuisine known as Chakaiseki, which is deeply linked to the traditions of the tea ceremony. Every slice of sashimi is prepared with the utmost attention. The natural flavor of each ingredient is used to its full effect. Meticulous attention is paid to the presentation of each dish, so that it looks most appetizing. Accents such as maple leaves add a sense of the season. Of all the many culinary techniques Takahashi employs, he places greatest importance on preparing his dashi. He's been running the restaurant since he was 28. He wasn't content merely to carry on serving dishes developed in the past. He also dedicated himself to creating new dishes. A few years after taking over, Takahashi decided to change the restaurant's dashi recipe. Instead of using kombu and katsuo, he chose to use dashi prepared with maguro bushi, dried yellow fin tuna. Compared to skipjack tuna, Yellowfin is considered a superior fish because its flavor is cleaner on the palate. Takashi says that the flavor of katsuobushi can be uneven, sometimes giving an astringent flavor. That is not the case with magurobushi. Through a long process of trial and error, Takahashi perfected a beautiful clear dashi broth that amazed everyone who tasted it. By sticking to the fundamentals, while also innovating, Takahashi succeeded in bringing a further depth of refinement to the traditional flavors. Takahashi Eiichi's son Yoshihiro has been in training under his father. Yoshihiro's aim is to create a dashi that is even better than his father's. In developing his own new dashi recipe, he has started to incorporate katsuobushi again. This time he's trying a 50-50 mixture of magurobushi and katsuobushi. Subtly changing the proportions alters the flavor. The elder Takahashi samples his son's new dashi. This one. This one's best. It's got an edge to it. Even the flavor of traditional dashi continues to evolve through the experimentation of chefs. Our aim is not just to protect the traditions all the time. It's important to bring in some fresh air, a sense of the present day. There are different ways of expressing tradition. The challenge is to select the right approach. It's not always easy to know what to do. The most important thing is figuring out how to build on your parents' ideas while also developing your own ideas. Honoring the tradition while adjusting it to the present day is the challenge that faces each generation. If you bear that in mind as you make improvements, then all will be well. The French city of Lyon is a center of French gastronomy. The Takahashis and other chefs from Kyoto have begun introducing Japanese cuisine abroad. Today they're addressing a group of young French chefs. Takahashi Eiichi carefully explains how to prepare dashi. In recent years, some French chefs have begun to incorporate Japanese dashi into their own cuisine. So, just using katsuobushi on its own does not produce umami? It only has half the depth of flavor. Umami is the savor that lingers after you eat. In this workshop, the younger Takahashi also demonstrates how to cook with kombu. 
I was amazed, thinking to myself, is this umami? It was a neutral flavor that we don't have in France. Japanese cuisine is always in search of purity and nuance, the subtlest shades of nuance. I want to build on our long tradition while continuing to move forward. Enthusiasm for Japanese cuisine continues to grow around the world. Its distinctive taste is built on umami, the deep savor from the dashi. Recently, Japanese cooking has been enjoying something of a boom in the West, partly because of its reputation for being healthy. Western cooking tends to depend on oil and butter to bring out stronger and richer flavors. Japanese cooking tends to go the other direction, using water combined with dashi to bring out lighter and subtler tastes. They may seem a little weak to begin with, but light and understated definitely don't mean tasteless and it's dashi and the umami which is embodied in it which helps to bring out the inherent flavors of the boiled ingredients to return to our musical metaphor from earlier in the show one might even say that japanese cooking is at least in part about the harmony between the flavor of the ingredients themselves and the flavor of the dashi i'm going to ponder on that a little bit and i'll see you again next time bye bye